So now, oh, I am so excited to, to welcome back to the History Center our friend Rick Kilby. Um, Rick is a 1986 graduate of the University of Florida. He's a graphic designer, author, blogger, and he is president of Kilby Creative in Orlando. Rick has been an avid roadside enthusiast since attending his first conference of the Society for Commercial Archaeology in 2002. In 2013, Rick published Finding the Fountain of Youth, which we have outside for you to purchase and take home to read and enjoy. Um, Finding the Fountain of Youth, Ponce de Leon in Florida's Magical Waters. And the book was awarded a Florida Book Award in Visual Arts category the same year. Now, on a personal note, let me tell you a little bit about our relationship with Rick and why we enjoy so much having him here. I guess three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, we had, we ran across this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to commemorate the centennial celebration of the Dixie Highway. And we all talked about how important that is to Polk County and how Florida's footprint changed with the opening of the Dixie Highway from M Montreal to Miami. People could travel through the state. And what a great story to tell. We had no idea how to tell a story other than we knew it was going to be really exciting. So we connected with our friend Rick. And Rick took us on that journey and helped us connect those pieces about the Dixie Highway and about um, just the opening of Florida tourism, really. And we went back and visited, you'll remember last year, some of those wonderful whimsical tourism sites. Today, Rick is going to take us on a little bit of a different journey. We know his love and passion for Florida Springs and Florida Waterways. And today, he is going to talk to us about um, Florida Springs and the built environment from the Paleo Native Americans to modern uh, the modern built industry in Polk County. So goodness gracious, join me in welcoming our friend Rick Kilby. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me all right? So this is actually my third time speaking here. Was anyone here when I spoke the first time? Thank you. <laughs> I've tried to switch it up so you won't have the same content. But that was when I was speaking about my book the last time I was here, I was talking about the Dixie Highway. This time, I'm talking about springs. So has everyone here been to a Florida spring? Yes, most of us have. If you haven't, hopefully I can light a fire that will make you want to get out and go to a spring because it's my belief they're an incredible, precious resource for the state, and we need to do everything we can to preserve them for future generations. Don't go there. Don't go there. Okay. Don't go there. Okay. Right there. Right there. Right here. I will stay right here from now on. This is my sweet spot. All right. So that's me in the center. I grew up in Gainesville, which is the heart of springs country. Florida has over a thousand freshwater springs throughout the state, but Gainesville is right in the doorway, the the entryway to the springs country, because there's springs everywhere up there. So we went to springs all the time. We had no idea the names of some of the springs we went to. We went to so much. That's the Ocklawaha River. The Ocklawaha River is fed by the springs of Silver Springs. And this is Silver Springs. Who's been to Silver Springs? <laughs> Silver Springs at one time was the largest array of freshwater springs in the entire world. Not the state, not the country, but the world at one point. And it's probably the state's oldest tourist attraction. And it was visited by people like Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote the famous book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is said to have been the most widely read book of the 19th century. And she lived in Mandarin, and she went to Silver Springs, and she said there's nothing on this earth comparable to Silver Springs. But this is my contention. This is my thesis. Nowhere else in the world will you find anything like the springs of Florida. From a historical perspective, because of all the history at our springs, from a cultural perspective, because of all the rich culture at our Florida Springs, and from a, a, just the perspective of a natural resource, there's nothing else like our states, and they are worthy of our protections. So these last four slides have all been shots of different phases of Silver Springs, and this is the current phase, and you can see that stuff in the foreground is not green shag carpet. It's a sign of a not healthy spring. So my journey, I talked about this the first time I was here, started as a spring that really isn't even a spring. It's the Fountain of Youth Attraction in St. Augustine. Who's been there? I love that place. That's where I got obsessed with the, tracking down the myth of the Fountain of Youth. Of course, as I got more obsessed with the myth and Ponce de Leon, all roads led to our springs because that's what the myth said Ponce was looking for. And so I kept collecting these images of him and this, this body of water at the beach that was supposedly the fountain of youth. But what I found was, as I dug deeper and I started learning about the springs and how springs were promoted in our history, 
Many of them promoted themselves as the fountain of youth, starting with this, Warm Mineral Springs in Northport, Florida, Ponce de Leon Springs, which was originally called Spring Garden Springs in Volusia County. There's actually two Ponce de Leon Springs state parks in the state of Florida. Wakulla Springs, which is near Tallahassee in the Panhandle. The owner of Wakulla Springs, Ed Ball, said Ponce not only visited once, he visited twice, and he had the arrowhead that killed Ponce. He was a big fibber. <laughs> this is Wall Springs, which is a county park in Pinellas County, but it claimed to be the fountain of youth and people came there to take the waters. And this is Salt Springs in the Ocala National Forest. All the springs, I think if you could find ads over time, all these springs probably claimed at one point or another to be the fountain of youth. So I dug deeper and I learned this, the history of our springs. So going back to the Paleo Indians, some of the oldest artifacts of um, human beings found in the state were found in the waters of the Itchitugni, in the Itchitugni Springs, going back thousands of years. We know that people have lived in the state of Florida from 13 to 15,000 years ago because of some of the artifacts found in our springs. And that we know that some of these ancient people believed water was sacred because they believed all of nature was sacred. And that they were the first people to actually build structures along the springs. This is an artist rendering from a booklet about Silver Springs, an artist depiction of the Timucuan Shrine of the Water Gods. But you can still find archaeological evidence of their existence today. This is actually a shell midden right along Silver Glen Run or Silver Glen Springs that was made by Paleo Indians thousands of years ago. And later when the Seminole Indians became the prominent tribe in the state of Florida, we know that those were mostly Creek Indians who came from Georgia and South Carolina. They too fought, thought that our springs were sacred. So that if they were fighting other tribes and they came to a spring, they would put aside their, business, their differences because they believed the waters of the springs were sacred. And they would not have any kind of hostilities around a spring. But that paradigm shifted when the Europeans arrived. So this is 1565, Pedro Menendez and a developer building a strip mall. <laughs> because the Europeans had a different view of springs. Throughout their history they believed certain waters were sacred. They had this rich tradition going back of going to sacred waters like places like Lourdes where they, they, people could get healings and stuff. But when they came to the New World they saw water strictly as a commodity. So, so they directed the water in some places and they used it as a force for mills. And so many of the springs actually had mills built right on them. This is De Leon Springs in Volusia County and there's a reproduction of this mill wheel I'll show you there. But that goes back hundreds of years. And other waters were bottled. This is actually Blue Springs. There's probably five or six different Blue Springs in the state. This is the one in Volusia County. And this water was so good that it was bottled and given high awards because of the taste of the water. And you can see here all the different minerals it was said to have that made the water so great. This is another one. This is Wakaiwa Springs. Wakaiwa Springs was originally called Clay Springs. It's in Orange County or Seminole County. It's in Central Florida. But the water there supposedly cured rheumatism, kidney and bladder trouble. And of course our water from our springs is still bottled today. Zephyr Hills is probably one of the leading brands and they have four different places they take water from the aquifer today. The other, another way our water was used for drinking water wasn't bottled water but sources of, of municipal drinking water. This is Bulware Springs in Gainesville and you can see from this historical marker it's probably hard to read but one of the reasons the University of Florida moved to Gainesville was they were promised the supply of drinking water from Bulware Springs. So for years and years and years that's where the drinking water came from, Bulware Springs. This is actually in Tampa. This was called Magby Springs and for years this was the source of drinking water in Tampa. Uh, the spring has since been renamed Eulalie Springs and it's been restored. This is when I first visited, this is the spring run, this pipe going into the Hillsborough River which is very kind of sad but they, some guy, one individual cobbled together four or five different grants and restored the spring and they completely restored the spring basin and the spring run and this is what it looks like today and you can see well I'm sorry you can see in this photograph it's right by the city of Tampa there's downtown Tampa right there and this is an urban spring it's not a very big spring but it, it shows that our springs are, are resources worthy of protection and restoration you can see fish have come back and they've actually had manatees return to this spring 
This is another one. This is called Manatee Mineral Springs. It was, again, you can read the history. Originally the Indians came there and then settlers. And you know, it's hard to imagine how many springs attracted early settlers at first because it was a source of abundant drinking water. But many of them have been lost. This is Manatee Mineral Springs today. It's been capped and it's no longer there. So I have to wonder how many of these springs that were originally attracted and people came and drank the water are still there. For instance, Altamont Springs. There's no longer a spring in Altamont Springs, yet the town still has the name Altamont Springs. So in terms of the belt environment, I found this wonderful quote that as soon as Florida started being developed, people started altering the belt environment around them and building structures around the waters. And after the Civil War, that's when the state growth really took off because people started coming to the state in steamboats and on railroad. And one of the first places they went were to, the, were to our springs because people believed in the practice of taking the waters. You could either drink the waters or bathe in the waters and you could cure just about anything that ailed you. So let's look at the list. Rheumatism, gout, malaria, indigestion, nervous dyspepsia, whatever that is, constipation, loss of appetite, nervous prostration, skin diseases, liver diseases, jaundice, female troubles, eczema, and all blood afflictions. Anything that was wrong with you, you could go soak in the water and you could be cured. So they built these incredible structures to bring people, northerners down mostly, wealthy northerners, to take the waters. This is Swanee, um, Swanee Springs, it's in northern Florida, and this is what it looks like today. The structure is still there. That's not spring water. When the Swanee gets really high, the waters backflow into the structure. It still trickles out, but there's not a whole lot of flow. This is probably the biggest structure they built for taking the water. This is White Springs. It's just off I-75 in north central Florida. Look, four floors of people taking the water. This is what it looks like today. They had to knock down the top three floors, but the original bottom floor is still there. This is actually flood water coming in from the Swanee. Normally it looks like this, it's fairly dry. This is another one, this is in Taylor County, this is Hampton Springs. You can see they built this enormous resort hotel and again, all the things that would help heal, but this was mainly a hunting and fishing lodge. And this is what it looks like today. The lodge is long gone, but they just have a pool where the, the water comes out and you can tell it's full of minerals because you can smell the sulfur. And that's how you can usually tell when you go to a mineral spring. You smell the sulfur. It's really strong. It smells like rotten eggs. You guys will know if you go to one. This is probably the most famous place to take the waters in the state of Florida. This is Green Cove Springs, kind of between St. Augustine and Jacksonville. All the celebrities of the day, presidents, and industrialists all came by steamboat to Green Cove Springs to take the waters. And this is a more recent photo. This is probably our postcard, probably from the 1930s. This is the spring basin. Oops. This is the spring basin here. And it, the water goes under here into a pool and then out into the St. John's River. Here's a more recent photo. This is not like this anymore, actually. It's, been, it's being restored right now, actually and they were going to make it better. But if you want to take the waters and see if the healthful properties of springs work for you, this is one of three places I know in the state to do it. Well, actually, when it's restored. This is the other one. This is in Safety Harbor. This was originally called Espiritu Santo Springs. It was discovered by the Spanish explorer De Soto. And there's been some kind of health spa there going back as far as the 1920s and even beyond, actually. And that's what it looks like inside. There's really nothing that looks like a spring once you go inside. It's all swimming pools and it's a, it's a contemporary spa, but the waters are still there, the healthful waters. There was actually five springs on the site, actually. And this is the last place if you want to take the waters. This is Warm Mineral Springs. Who's heard of Warm Mineral Springs? It's in Northport, Florida. And it's mostly used by Eastern Europeans because they believe the combination of minerals there is unlike any place they've ever been to in their entire, throughout Europe. So there's all these, you go to this hotel there and they're flying the flag of, of Germany and Poland and Russia because that's who they cater to, all these people who come here. And it's still open today. It was half owned by the county of Sarasota County and the city of Northport and they battled back and forth for control of it. And I think either county or city owns 100% now and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. But it's about 25 bucks and you can go and take the waters. It's a very interesting place and it has incredible archeological history. So think about this. It's actually shaped like an hourglass. So the center of the hourglass is a ledge and they found all these incredible artifacts. They found a saber-toothed tiger skull with a spear point in it. That means it was hunted by man. 
and they actually found, because it's anaerobic, they actually found a human skull thousands of years old that still had brain matter. No. And so it's a national landmark because of the archaeological stuff that they have in there. So the built environment wasn't always big, grand, four-story edifices. This is one that was called Cedar Stump Springs. And it's just somewhere in the panhandle. And the water trickled up from the cedar stump in the middle. And so they just built this little brick thing. And people went there and took the waters and, and would bottle the waters because they believed it was helpful. But also note, so many promotional images use pretty girls. And you'll note again and again and again a slide. One of the best ways to promote springs was pretty girls. This is Sulphur Springs. This is a Burger Brothers photograph. Sulphur Springs was in Tampa and it started in the early 20s, was developed by a guy named Richardson as a place to take the waters and a big recreational place. Can you look at the height of that? It's crazy. This is uh, Glen Springs in Gainesville. I went to high school two blocks from this spring and never even knew it was there until years afterwards. But this was the place originally the University of Florida swim team would practice. But I want to point out to you this, this trend where we don't see natural springs anymore. The, the built environment is actually a pool where there's not a natural kind of um, shore along the springs anymore. We've kind of pooled it in. It's kind of like putting nature on a leash. And that's a trend that, that happened starting in the Victorian era where we kind of wanted to control nature because we wanted everything to be kind of neat and orderly. And so I'm going to show you a series of springs that have been pulled. This is the spring head at Glen Springs now. It's kind of a sad story because the spring's in bad shape. It's actually owned by the Elks Club. And they wanted to restore it like the spring in Tampa. And they got a deal together and they raised all the money and the Elks Club decided not to sell it. So it, that pool is being eroded to slowly underneath and at some point it's going to cave in and it's going to be a lot bigger project to restore. This is another one. This is a mineral spring called Magnesia Springs that was located just east of Gainesville in the city of Hawthorne. I remember swimming in there in a little kid, as a little kid and not knowing it was a spring at all except it was really cold because it looks like a swimming pool. Today it looks a lot more natural even though it's not, not beautiful at all. Um, that's actually duckweed on the top. It's not algae. And again, this is for sale. If you want to buy it, it's a couple million dollars. <laughs> A lot of the springs today are in private ownership. Many of them are state parks and county parks, but a lot of them are in private ownership. And there's a couple for sale, and I'll point those out. So this is DeLeon Springs. Again, I said this was Spring Garden Springs. It was visited by John James Audubon. At some point, they jumped on the bandwagon, renamed it after Ponce de Leon. But it was a beautiful, natural-looking spring originally. And then they pulled it in, and they really started to use this whole myth of Ponce de Leon, and they featured the the uh, minerals in the water, and they talked about sulfur, lime, soda, and lithia. They bottled the water. They did all those things. And they built this incredible hotel in the 1920s as part of the Florida land boom. And, people, and they had a restaurant and a casino and dance floors. And you come there, stay there, take the waters. They had a diving platform, too. And you can see this is the edge. And you can see that mill that I talked about earlier. So it's been restored over the years. I think the original mill is long gone. But it's always remained true to what it originally looked like from historical photographs. So how many people saw my exhibit that was downstairs? You might recognize this. That's where that came from. That was the entry, entrance to De Leon Springs because it made the transition from being a healthful spring to a, a full roadside attraction with things like Queenie, the water skiing mermaid. I mean, the water skiing elephant, I'm sorry. There was actually not one, but two water skiing elephants at De Leon Springs, and they had everything that you would want in a roadside attraction, including beautiful girls. <laughs> and here's what it looks like today. Has anybody been there? It's a wonderful place because this place right here is called the Old Spanish Mill. And it's a restaurant, and each table has a griddle, and they bring you pancake batter. It's not air conditioned, so don't go in the heat of summer because that table gets really hot. But you can make your own pancakes and they bring you all the toppings and you bring you all the food and it's one of my favorite places in the entire state. And the spring's right there and you can go on canoe trips. It's a great place. So that's another thing I want to point out. One of the reasons springs are so wonderful is they are incredible recreational resources and they have a huge economic value to the state. Another reason for protection. Anybody want to guess what spring this is? All right, here's a hint. Some homeschoolers may be going there soon. 
Rainbow Springs, this is what Rainbow Springs used to look like. It still doesn't look that different. They used to have photo subs that would go underneath the water and you could take pictures and they used to have steamboats, but it's a beautiful spring. And they also have a waterfall, which is kind of strange because there's not that much elevation. But it's interesting, the waterfall was actually created from like sand mountain. They took all the sand from phosphate mining and built up the sides and that created enough elevation so that they could have a waterfall. So you'll get to see the waterfall when you go. And this is that photo sub right there where you're actually under the water. Unfortunately, they don't have those. They're still on site if you look around through places you're not supposed to go. Don't do that. The photo <laughs> subs are on land rusting away, sadly. Here's what it looks like today. It's a beautiful spring. So I said Silver Springs at one point was the largest spring or array of springs in the world. Right now the largest spring on land is Rainbow Springs. The, the aquifer has been kind of readjusted in, the, in terms of flow. So Rainbow Springs is the number one spring. This is another one that was a roadside attraction. This is Homosassa Springs. It's a state park now. They built this incredible underwater observatory where you could actually get under the water and see the fish. And it's really interesting because they have a mixture of fresh and saltwater fish. And so here's what it looks like today. It's a really great place to see manatees. They actually do manatee rehabilitation there. This is Silver Springs. So this is the early days of Silver Springs. This photo goes back to probably 1903 or so. So what you would do is you would get on a steamboat in Jacksonville and we'd go up the St. John's River because the St. John's River flows north, so going up is actually going south. And you would go up the Ocklawaha River to the Silver River to Silver Springs. And they actually had a hotel right on the water where if you stayed there, there was a trap door above the water so you could fish from your hotel room. <laughs> Pretty cool. This is the Silver Springs of my childhood. I re this is the way I remember it. There was this underwater observatory. So that photo I showed at the very beginning, that was actually my brother. This is where he is in the underwater observatory. And they had a swimming beach. There's talk that now they may have the swimming beach come back. We'll see. I've seen the size of the gators in there, and I'm not sure it's a good idea. <laughs> but we'll see. This is the glass bottom boats they still have to this day. And again, pretty girls. But note how clean the water is and how clear the sandy bottom is. And here's what the bottom looks like today. You can see as a contrast, what's, I'll, I'll talk about what's happened in the, in the year since then. The famous, most famous roadside attraction of any springs, of course, it's got to be Weeki Wachi, started in the 1940s by a guy named Newt Perry. And again, pretty girls always make a spring seem more enticing, so they had mermaids. And again, here's a contemporary photo. This is from a calendar, and you can see, again, the sandy white bottom is now covered with gunk. It kind of looks like a horror movie to me. <laughs> and we're pretty aware of the problem there. This is a cartoon that ran in the Tampa Bay Times talking about these are supposed to be mermaids in biohazard suits. <laughs> Another thing we've done to our springs is they have been an amenity to lure people to buy land around them. So going back to, this is a, from a brochure that came out in the 1870s with the Silver Springs Land Company and they were trying to develop. This is from the land boom of the 1920s where they had it all platted out. Uh, this is DeLeon Springs down here and this never got built out actually because you know the bust happened. And, but it was seen as a way to lure people to buy property. This is actually San Lando Springs, which was called San Lando because it's halfway between Sanford and Orlando. And it's now a gated development known as the Springs. And it's beautiful. It looks like paradise. Unfortunately, they have to clean out the algae uh, to keep it looking like this. So that's kind of the histor history of the, the built environment. Now I want to look at the cultural aspects of Springs. So if you're familiar with William Bartram, he was a naturalist who came to Florida in the 18th century and went and just and went to many of our springs and he wrote this about it. He found the springs to be enchanting and amazing crystal fountains, continual amazing ebullition where the waters are thrown up in such an abundance and amazing force as to jet and swell up two or three feet above the common surface. If you've been to a spring, you know that part that's called the boil where it comes above the surface. Can you imagine a boil that's two or three feet above the surface? And that's what he wrote about. While his description of the spring so influenced the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he wrote this famous poem by Kubla, called Kubla Khan that I remember having to learn in school. Some of you may have had to learn in school. I couldn't say it again. But he talked about where Alf the Sacred River, 
That is a description of Florida Springs and a famous, famous English poet poem. Of course, our own famous writers like Marjorie Kennan Douglas, sorry, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, Marjorie, that's a different Marjorie, <laughs> wrote The Yearling. In the very first passage, she talks about a bubbling spring rising forever from the earth with an endless current that was the beginning of the water sliding to the sea. So that is a, talking about Silver Glen Springs, and this is called Jody Spring. This is an actual place that she wrote about. And the waters eventually make their way to the St. John's River and end up in the Atlantic Ocean. So other artists continue to be influenced by our springs. This is an artist named Margaret Ross Talbert who lives in Gainesville and she actually takes her canvases to springs and paints them on site. So you're talking six and eight foot canvases and she paints them right at the springs. And she also takes smaller canvases underwater and draws underwater in the springs. And some of our most bizarre forms of culture, this is actually from the Orlando Fringe Festival. This was a play about the mermaids of Wikiwachi. You can see how widespread springs have influenced Florida culture, even music. This is my homeboy Tom Petty from Gainesville, and he wrote about Glen Springs in one of his songs, Dreamville. It gives me goosebumps every time I think about it because it's talking about my home. In this spring, Glen Springs, the one by Gainesville High School. And here's a contemporary shot that I talked about how it's going to cave in. This is the part that's slowly eroding. And I hope that they find a way to restore it because it's a beautiful spot right in the middle of Gainesville. Kissingen Springs, I think you know about Kissingen Springs. It was near Fort Meade. And this is materials I got right here in the archives. And, well, this, this image isn't. It was the hub of social activity in Polk County, in this area of Polk County in particular. This is the historic marker. It talks about Kissingen Springs. Actually, I found out it was originally called Ponce de Leon Springs at one point. <laughs> but it's not the only spring that's dried up. Here are some others. Fen Holloway, a paper mill, took, diverted so much of the water it's dried up. Hampton Springs. I showed you that there is flow, but it's just not very pretty. White Springs, I showed you. Worthington is pretty much completely dried up. Um, there's at least 20 springs that used to flow into the Ocklawaha River that have been lost because they built Rodman Dam and the weight of the water doesn't allow them to flow. Every three years they drain Rodman's reservoir to get rid of the aquatic growth and those springs come back to life for three or four months every three or four years. So here's what's happening. This shows you, this is a, a graphic from, from the Florida Springs Institute and it talks about how much the aquifer has gone down in different areas because of the growth of Florida largely. And so this area right here, that's all the water that percolates into the ground there comes out in Silver Springs in that large area. And then here is the one for Rainbow Springs. So it's a large area. So when the water percolates into the ground and goes into the Florida aquifer, it comes up in our springs. And here's a great graphic. So you know how you have a bucket and it has that little cutout where you pour out? That's what a spring is. When there's a place low enough for the aquifer to come to the surface, it's like a cutout in a bucket. So if you have a, a bucket that's overflowing and the water level goes down, it can't come to that little cutout. And that's what happens is the, uh, when a spring dries up. So well, ironically, one of the reasons springs are drying up is a connection again to the Fountain of Youth because at one point the state decided let's use this whole myth of Fountain of Youth and lure people to Florida and the state will grow. Because Florida grew much later than most of the states in the east because it was just such a swampy, miserable place. So they really had to promote it. So they, they connected themselves to the myth of the Fountain of Youth and started doing ads with Ponce de Leon and The Right Idea and Man's Oldest Quest, the quest for the Fountain of Youth, and what the Discover spot bought. And there is a Fountain of Youth in Florida. But this is my favorite. Being a practical man, Thomas Edison wouldn't say there was a Fountain of Youth. He would just add five years to your life for moving to Florida because he was practical. He was a scientist. So it worked. We saw this huge boom in growth after World War II. People started coming to Florida. And now we are the third largest state in the entire Union by population. At one point, a 1,000 people a day were moving to the state of Florida. And the fastest growing area is the villages. And the villages is still saying it's the Fountain of Youth. And this is what it looks like. So can you imagine all those people watering their lawns, some of them fertilizing their lawns and it, 
you know, it depletes the aquifer and then the fertilizer goes down into the aquifer and someplace they have septic tanks and that contributes to the quality of our springs. And so you can see this bar graph showing how Florida has just exploded in growth, especially after World War II and it's gone higher and higher and higher. And then you look at the nitrogen level in Silver Springs and you can see the direct correlation between the growth of the state and the nitrogen which causes the pollution, which causes algae bloom. And when algae blooms, it chokes out the native vegetation and it dies and sets into effect this whole chain of events that hurts the natural environment. So here's the flow and you can see the red line is Rainbow Springs and the blue line is Silver Springs. So Silver Springs flow has diminished over time and Rainbow Springs has gone higher. Of course, it's not just people watering their lawns. Agriculture is a big part of that, and this is center pivot irrigation. So there's a big sprinkler right in the middle of all these circles, and all that water is being sucked up from the aquifer. This is right in Springs Country in the, near the Suwannee River, and all that is being fertilizer, and the nitrogen and the phosphorus are going down into the aquifer, polluting our springs. And so here's a good depiction of this. This is right near a spring. This is all stuff being sprayed onto our springs, and this is the cave in Silver Springs. So all the stuff we put on top of the land ends up in our springs eventually. So this is Sulphur Springs. I showed you the one with the top high tower. This is what it looks like, Sulphur Springs. This is what it looks like today. It's a large source of drinking water for Tampa, but it's also highly polluted. And so it's very ironic that I went there and it was a very, very hot day and I was thirsty and I didn't have any water. And I had to walk all along this part and I found a drinking fountain and got a big drink. Got into my car. And the first thing I heard on the radio, there was a boil water alert. <laughs> and I worried that I was going to get sick because I drank the water there. And it was very interesting to think, because I was staying in Tampa, and we couldn't drink the water that entire time. So Starbucks wasn't open. It was awful. You couldn't have coffee. No place could have coffee because they couldn't, you had to boil the water, and then you just couldn't turn the tap. The entire city of Tampa was under a boil water alert because a squirrel got someplace and the, something short-circuited and all this stuff happened. But it made me think about how precious water is and how it affects everything we do in life. So I talked about the chain of events that happens once the algae grows and the native, the underwater plants can't, can't survive anymore. This is a picture from 1979 of Gilchrist Blue Springs, which is one of the prettiest springs in the entire state. So this is the same place and you can see there, how little growth is. It's still a beautiful spring, but there's much less growth. It's not always like that. This is, there was a phenomenon in 2013 and I heard this turtle scientist give a talk about this. So for some reason, hundreds of turtles from the Santa Fe River went to Gilchrist Blue Springs and they'd have no idea why. It's like every turtle in the river went there. And they know how many turtles were there because they blocked off the spring run and they actually caught each turtle and they counted it. And they ate every living thing in the spring run. And then they left. And nobody knows why. If it was a breeding thing, or if they couldn't find any other food, or what. But it's so interesting to me that there's crazy phenomena happening like this in our springs, and we don't understand it. Which shows me there's so much we have yet to learn about our springs. Unfortunately, much of this is, is what the way it looks. And you can see the bass in the center. It's just not very good habitat for him to live in. And this soft-shelled turtle. And this, this is a graphic I created that's in High Springs in a, ex a museum exhibit right now. And 32% in, in flow since the 1930s in our springs and 82% of our springs are considered impaired. So what, my reaction to that is I work with a nature photographer named John Moran and an art historian named Leslie Gamble and we started, started the Springs Eternal Project. We did a museum exhibit that travels the state and it's mostly consists of before and after shots showing the state of our springs. This is the blue hole in the Itchitutney and you can see here's what it looked like in health, when it was healthy in 1995 and here's what it looked like not even 20 years later and that's not a healthy spring. We also have a website, we've brought buses, Leslie Gamble has created summer camps for kids to go and learn more out about our springs. But what concerns me is that if we allow our springs to decline to such a state that all is left is places like this. This is the retail area of the villages that's named Spanish Springs. And it's kind of fake history. Or this. This looks like a beautiful spring. But this is not a beautiful spring. This is Disney World. Their retail area is called Disney Springs. 
And so I went to Disney Springs and I went to the, stood on this bridge and I witnessed several times people coming here thinking this was a real Florida spring. <laughs> and on the one hand, you know, I'm kind of, I like the fact that Disney is paying its respects. It's an homage to Florida Springs and I like that. But I don't want this to be the best looking spring in the state because it's really a swimming pool. It's really all it is. It's filtered water and it's made to look like a swimming pool. And it's, it's not the same thing. This is what our spring looks like. This is Sweetwater Spring. This is in the middle of the Ocala National Forest. And you, you have to get a lottery to get to this spring. There's a cabin that was built by the CCC during um, the era of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And you have to win a lottery and you get it for a week. And it has its own private spring. And there's that dock, and it's a magical place. You know, it's one of those places you go at night and you can see all the stars because there's nothing else around it. That's what a spring should look like. This is Disney again, because in the lagoon, right outside the swimming pool area that is their fake spring, that's what it looks like. They, they, even they are not exempt from our state's water quality issues. So, again, this is my contention. Over the years, we have changed the springs. If we really want to help the springs, we need to allow the springs to change us. Because I think Jamie was the one who came up with the name for the talk, the wonder of our Florida Springs, and they are wonder and they are magic. And if you go to these places, I believe they can have an effect on you and really change you. This is Gilchrist Blue Springs. I think this is the prettiest spring in the state of Florida. It's near High Springs. It's incredible. If you go though, don't go in the middle of summer, it'll be really crowded. This is another one. This is somewhat impaired, but it's a beautiful spot because it's so hard to get to. It's on the Chazahowitzka River, and you have to take a canoe to a point where you can't canoe any longer because the water gets too shallow. Then you have to wade up a creek, and then it, the room, it's like the forest kind of opens up, and there's this oasis with this chasm, this emerald chasm in the middle of the floor, and this water bubbling up from the center of the earth. This is Alexander Springs and the Ocala National Forest. Some of our prettiest springs are in the Ocala National Forest. Again, you snorkel along and it's about six feet deep water and then all of a sudden opens up this big hole where you can't even see the bottom. It's like a chasm in Florida. You know, it's, it's rocks. It's our Grand Canyon with water. This is Jenny Springs. It's just up the Santa Fe River from Gilchrist Blue Springs. Another beautiful place, but it's very crowded. It's kind of a young person's resort and place to party. But the springs are incredible there. This is in Rock, this is Rock Springs where they have this incredible cardboard boat race every year. And I love the fact that our springs are so well loved by young people because it's so much fun. So what you do is you get a couple of hours, some duct tape and cardboard and you make a boat and you see how well you can do in a series of heats. And you have to win three heats in order to win the race. By the third heat, most of these are very soggy boats. <laughs> so I believe if we're going to save our springs, we need to kind of look at the attitude of the early Native Americans that saw them as sacred. We need to reconnect with that because many of the indigenous people had this myth, this creation myth, that a turtle rose up out of the waters and that's where the earth came from. And you can re-experience the same thing. And that the myth of the fountain of youth, one of the sources is baptism. And things like that still happen in these sacred waters. This is a baptism in the Itchituckney River. And that people used to make pilgrimages to these places. And I still believe when you go to Springs, you can ha still have that reverent attitude of making a pilgrimage to a sacred place. And that the rivers that the Springs feed can be sacred as well. That's the River Jordan. And this is Rock Springs Rung. This is the Kumbla Melon. This is the largest Kumbla Mela, I'm sorry, the largest peaceful pilgrimage in the entire world in India. And that's the um, Ganges, Ganges River. That there's a sacredness to our water, again, if you get and reconnect it. And that you can still feel the healing forces of water. Of course, a lot of it is just being in 72 degree water. It's really, really cold. And it, it, we were talking about it early. All the people who remember Kissingen Springs, that's their predominant memory is how cold the water is because it's freezing. But it's still an incredible recreational resource. You go to any state park that's a spring now, you're going to likely find it crowded because people love springs. There's something about water and about spring water that we love so much because, and of course in Florida, it's one way to beat the heat. But there's this connection to the past that's there. And I believe you can tap into that as well. This is Silver Springs. And people have been living at Silver Springs for thousands of years. And that's an incredible thing to think about. And that 
we need to go beyond looking at it as a resource, but we also need to understand there is an economic value to our springs. You know, the, the restaurant at De Leon Springs does very well, and there's all these corresponding businesses that need the healthy spring in order to stay in business. And there's some, again, a magic to them. This is an ancient Roman bath, and this is a spring called Ginger Ale Springs. My favorite story about this is there's no sign or anything to get to this little spring, and there's all this mythology about it was a ginger ale bottling plant, but nobody's really sure. I love it you, when you start to investigate stuff about our springs, you can't answer all your questions by Googling it because there's still so much, and they're still finding springs that aren't, aren't, aren't on the map. So that's so exciting. So the first time I went this to the spring, I found it real easily, and it's very interesting because there's little shrines all around it. Like it's a kind of interesting place. Next time I went, I went to the exact same place. The spring wasn't there. I couldn't find it. It was like it didn't want me to see it that day. But I swear it's still there. So the, the, the main thing though, the takeaway is this is Rock Springs in the 1920s. And you can see the water's flowing from this cave. And here's a contemporary photo. The cave is completely dry now. So you can crawl back into that cave if there's a gate you have to unlock. But it's up to us if we want to have these for your kids and your kids' kids to enjoy the way we have. So here's some things you can do. Um, it, you know, take care of your own stuff, but it's larger than what one person and one family can do to take care of our springs. We need to have this kind of um, awareness of what we can do. And this is an illustra illustration of that, showing it much more in interesting than words. But thank you for enjoying me. Go to a spring, enjoy it. I'll answer questions later and go to a spring. <laughs>